we're going to be talking about how the Bristol Cable is redefining local media and trying to bring up a sustainable and investigative model for local journalism. It's essentially a platform that involves people who want to see journalism produced in a different way. It's a, a membership organisation, membership led. We've got currently 1,200 members. We produce a quarterly publication that comes out in print that we distribute across the city. And we also have an online um, website in which we release our content. And then we are a platform that uh, organizes all sorts of talks, events, uh, workshops uh, for members and members of the public. In broad terms, what I'm going to be to talking about today, what we're going to introduce with Lorna, is we're going to talk about the concept behind um, the Bristol Cable. Why is it relevant? Why is it necessary to build such a, an organization today? What is it addressing? What kind of issues with local media? We're going to be also talking about how that has been sort of done over time, who has been involved in this process, and also what it is that we're producing. Uh, so we're going to get more in depth into that as we speak. Um, but to start with, um, I'd like to first of all introduce a bit of the background behind the thinking of why a media cooperative could address some of the issues that are, exist today with local media. And some of the uh, issues that have been identified by us is essentially that the um, local media sector is being deeply affected by some kind of decline as a media landscape that is uh, seeing a waning uh, number of titles, titles going down, and also like some, uh, the results ongoing from that, a uh, lack of information that is relevant to the public, and also a lack of trust that is coming uh, out of the, the local media. So one of the several reasons that we uh, have out, uh, outlined and analyzed to um, explain this are that um, local media predominantly relies, as well as just the um, general print industry, relies on uh, advertising as its main source of revenue. That has been, over the years, declining, essentially due to um, the rise of uh, online content, blogs, uh, various news gathering uh, websites. And, if you, and that essentially means that uh, the information and the sources of information get much more diffused and the reliance on local print is declining over time. Um, the impact that that is having on the various uh, publishers is that there is an imperative as a result to reduce uh, the costs of the operations. And that means cutting off staff, uh, reducing the resources that are made available for people to produce uh, journalism. And the consequences of that is essentially that the journalism that is being produced is um, of much uh, lower quality. There's much less uh, you know, time and resources to be able to investigate and to do in-depth journalism, to produce uh, stories that go to the bottom of various different issues. And the tendency is to produce advertorials, uh, rehash press releases, and cover content uh, on a local level that is uh, more inclined to look towards lifestyle issues uh, and, and, and the sorts. So what we find also as well is that in, in the type of um, production of journalism that is out there, there's an increasing sort of conservatism, either because of the ownership structure behind it or just merely by the, uh, the activities and, and the positions of editors who are less interested in doing the work of uh, journalism to really dig into stories. Um, and this is here uh, an example of the type of story that would be considered as an exclusive, otherwise a bit of a kind of mark of quality journalism for other publications, for our, uh, lo one of our local media outlets, uh, Bristol 24-7, which essentially announces the opening of a new uh, restaurant, and that's considered as an, an exclusive. Um, one of the main uh, results behind the, the pressures that is faced by the local media sector uh, is that some decisions by the uh, editors and CEOs of uh, various different companies are to essentially shape and, shape and change the, uh, the role of the, the journalist. So here we have David Montgomery, who is the CEO of Local World, which is the owner of one of the uh, pa local papers, the only daily paper in Bristol called the Bristol Post, uh, who in a leaked letter uh, to the to his uh, members of staff, announced what the journalist will eventually uh, come to, to become, and that is that the journalist will offer an attractive platform for this content and large measure of control over to uh, people to self-publish. So 
here the journalist is essentially a content harvester and is uh, sort of forced into releasing um, journalistic content on the go and therefore like to, to do a very superficial job of it. Um, so we can also have a look and make a critique of local media by looking at the uh, ownership structures behind it. And what we found is that local world, so the owner of the Bristol Post was recently bought up by uh, Trinity Mirror, one of the sort of largest conglomerates owning um, most of actually the, the local media titles across the country, a part of just three other conglomerates that own 70% uh, of, uh, of the shares on the, of the percentage of uh, titles um, on the local uh, media market. And looking at what's happening behind the ownership of Trinity Mirror reveals that essentially it is a big business, big finance that are direct shareholders of uh, Trinity Mirror with obviously the imperatives to seek some high returns on the profits and investments that are made and therefore an inclination to uh, favour revenue over quality of content and so we can see like a trickle down effect on, on the journalism that is being produced. So this is essentially a presentation of a pyramidal ownership structure and it's something that happens in local media uh, uh, at large but also very specifically for what you could consider more um, local papers that just operate in that remit and have owners that are just basically locally based. Um, you will have figures that are heavily involved in business that will be the owners of um, certain local media outlets. So the idea and the issues that um, are, have been raised here are that there is a, a decline in the quality and, uh, um, quali and quantity of local media available. And so the Bristol Cable steps in at this point to identify a place where there is a niche to essentially address and rebalance that um, deficit by thinking about how can we make local media sustainable financially but also ensure that the quality of the journalism provided is of an investigative nature and is challenging and is representative of and is covering most of the issues that are um, at stake um, on, a, on, a local, on a local level. Uh, and so the idea is to think of the cooperative as a model that can provide a solution to, to this. Um, so some of the key points that the Bristol Cable is keen to assert is really re-centralise the focus on media as a public good. The idea is to really create an incentive for the population to buy into um, what is essentially um, a, an imperative and necessary uh, element for you know, local democracy and politics to function uh, well and to in, in involve people in a very informed debate about the politics of everyday life. So the idea is also to make it as participative as possible, is to open up the ownership structures to really create a model whereby people become stakeholders of an organization, have a say in the way it is run. And that stems from people feeling like they share the values of a publication and an organization. So the Bristol Cable is value-based as opposed to wanting to define an audience that would be targeted uh, according to uh, gera generational sort of tranches or geographical kind of remit. The idea is to speak to a broad uh, amount of people uh, and to get them on board because of the, the principles that the cable adopts. Um, and the idea is to create uh, a journalism and a new form of media that is challenging of the um, structures and acts of ask questions and really um, tries to address issues that are otherwise uncovered by the media and hold people accountable, hold power accountable and investigate uh, who's behind certain decision making. So the pitch here of the Bristol Cable is essentially to sort of like move away from the mainstream of what can be found on a local media uh, market today and move towards something that has become de facto a bit radical in fact, so sort of going back to the roots of uh, investigative quality journalism on a local level. Um, just to give you a bit of a uh, potted history of how we uh, came about, the Bristol Cable um, was started back in uh, 2013 and the idea uh, at the time was just germinating, the cooperative was a bit of a kind of distant idea, a model that was appealing because of its uh, importance in various different other economic sectors across the country but also realising that it hadn't really been uh, applied to, um, to the media. Um, and so the idea started to hatch and it was about 
initially sort of making contact with the people in the community of Bristol. Bristol is a 400,000 uh, population strong uh, city in, in the west of, of the UK. And the idea was to get, make contact with individuals, various different community centers, uh, third sector organizations, uh, organizations that were already operating and uh, campaigning in various different areas, but also speaking to universities, uh, teachers, and um, other uh, media outlets that were existing to see what was the need for a new um, publication and a cooperative and just sourcing ideas as to what that could be. So here we've got an image of the first kind of poster that was created relating to uh, the Bristol Cable that was put up in a, in a window uh, of one of the sh sh shop fronts uh, down one of the main streets in a, in a, in a neighborhood of Bristol, trying to make the pitch for it. Um, we then moved on to, uh, well first of all, receiving uh, a grant of uh, 1,500 pounds that enabled us, coupled with uh, a crowdfunding uh, revenue of 3,000 pounds, to start producing some workshops. And the reason why we, uh, we decided that that investment was necessary is because we had to essentially make the case to people that we really wanted to invest in an organization that could really appeal and bring uh, skills and uh, information to a broad range of people. So the idea was to uh, essentially train up people that would then sort of become members and part of the, the organization and make it strive rather than just put money in the pocket of the organizers. So that was from the start the kind of social uh, principle behind the way the cable, the, the cable uh, operates. So off the back of these workshops, uh, which uh, over 300 people attended, uh, we organized a, a large public meeting where we essentially made the pitch for what the organization could really look like uh, and the initial structures for them and invited people to jump on board to help produce the first edition which was released in October uh, 2014. So this is us in the making trying to arrange the first lineup. Um, and so that was also the launch of crucially uh, our membership scheme which was to be the kind of be which is to be the, the bedrock of the organization in terms of revenue but in terms of democratic ownership and participation um, as well. Over to Lorna. To start off around this idea of building a community um, it's it's not only necessary for us to, to really make a sense of community in terms of our sustainability long term because we need members to be involved long term for the, for the organisation to work. But it's also about our politics, about those principles, about getting people involved in local politics, whatever their particular persuasion is, and just getting people to participate as much as possible in democracy and in the city. Um, so, yeah. This is kind of, that's the basis of, of how we organise. And this is what happens in practice, which is actually more simple than I think this diagram maybe looks if you're looking from back, the back of the room. But what we've got here is, this is kind of the city of Bristol. Our actual magazines are distributed for free all over the city in about 550 or 600 locations. So essentially we want it to be relevant and interesting to anybody who lives in Bristol who picks it up and reads it. Um, above that, here we've got our members. Um, as Alex said at the moment, we've got about 1,200 members. Um, many of those members are also contributors. So there's quite a lot of overlap between how people are involved. So <laughs> the city of Bristol, then up to our, our membership, and our membership feed information and tell us, as people who are coordinators, what they want to see and what they want us to do. We also have a, um, directors who are democratically elected in our annual meetings by the membership. And they're there acting as trustees and giving us technical or legal advice, things like that. The general idea is that if most media has shareholders and the sort of profit motive driving the decision making, and it's, you know, a kind of triangle like this, we want to be a triangle like this, where it's the membership as a base that is feeding the information and feeding the direction down to what we're doing as coordinators working for the organisation. So continuous participation is what we're aiming for. And there's several ways that we do that. So in a sort of person to person level, we have open co-op members meetings on a monthly basis. So anybody who's a member 
can come along and have their say. So we'll distribute the agenda beforehand and try and give people background information so they can come along and discuss things, whether it's to do with editorial decisions, financial decisions, advertising, whatever. And once a year, we've got the AGM. Uh, last AGM was in March, yes. Um, and that was kind of an opportunity to check in with some of the bigger questions about maybe making changes to our advertising charter or setting the budget for the year, some of those things. And to check that people on the whole are feeling that we're making the content that they want to see as well. And then on an ongoing basis, we also make use of an online platform called Lumio, which is like a forum where every member can have a, um, what do you call it, like a login and they can go and discuss things. And that's been really useful and it's becoming a lot more lively as we get bigger and bigger. Um, one example of that being used by the membership is like since the, the referendum, we suddenly had lots of members saying, we want you to be writing stories about migrants and refugees and asylum seekers in the city, and we'd like you to focus your efforts on that. So they can sort of say to us on the editorial team what they'd like us to focus on. And likewise, when we have a question that maybe comes up for us that we think is bigger than, or more about a matter of principle, so we don't want to just make the decision ourselves, we can then pass it to the membership. So recently, a few months ago, for example, we were discussing how and if we should cover the rise in nationalist and sort of fascist groups in the Southwest. And as we were discussing it, there was disagreements amongst ourselves about, you know, does no platform apply to this? Is it, you know, more good journalism to actually speak to these people? And we, and we thought, OK, we're going to ask the membership what they think. So we put it to the membership, and that prompted quite an a interesting discussion amongst everybody. Um, which we could then sort of learn from and, and listen to people's views on it. Uh, so yeah, that's an idea of how it works in practice. We've delivered workshops with local community groups, such as um, a group called the Creative Youth Network, which was for um, young people not in education, employment or training, for example. And we've been able to kind of deliver workshops in collaboration with these groups. And it's kind of all related to, to wanting to give a voice to people who don't normally have a platform in media and trying to encourage underrepresented groups to get involved as well. Um, there's also ongoing workshops that are either for the whole public or just for membership. And we've had some really top quality speakers come and talk to us. Uh, for example, a, a Guardian journalist called John Harris who's a supporter of The Cable, has come and done workshops for us on like video journalism, along with his um, filmer, John Demokos. Yep. Um, and we've also had skills training from Corporate Watch, um, Tableau, who were in here the, the talk before us. But yeah, the idea is that we want to um, allow people who are citizen journalists to get really good skills and learn from good people and empower people to be good reporters and know, you know how to, to go about out there and, and really write good stuff about what's going on in their community. Um, we've also done, what's this one? Ah, yes. So this is like community events rather than workshops. Um, this up here is from in the lead up to the general election in 2015. It was a public hustings um, called Get Heard Bristol West which was kind of spearheaded by the cable, but also supported by other community media groups. Um, there was Ujima Radio, which is a local Afro-Caribbean-led um, community radio show in, station in Bristol, and um, the Bristol Somali Media Group, and ACORN, which is a community housing rights organization. So this event was about getting people involved in, in the uh, election decisions, and not doing it in a typical way, where you've got a panel saying it's all very organised, but instead making it a lot more focused on the people and their questions and their voices. So it was organised in a way that was more about empowering the people who wanted to ask questions rather than the typical, I don't know, sound bites and people, politicians saying their bit. Um, and then here's a more fun one. <laughs> this was a film showing and we were lucky enough to have 
Ken Loach come and do a um, Q&A after showing one of his films, and that was, that was good. Um, so our sort of editorial stance has always been based on what we've been mandated by the membership to do. And interestingly, as Alec was explaining before about the problems with local media, often it seems that what people are constantly asking us to produce is diametrically opposed to what you generally see in the local press. So we get sold long-term stuff, investigative stuff, and analytical things that look at the big picture, also solution-based journalism, um, also sort of the voices of communities or people that may be marginalised normally. And how that works in practice is that we have, um, for example, foreign language pieces. We always publish things that are relevant to particular communities in the city in English and then in a, another language as well, for example. Um, one of those, for example, was somebody writing about why the Somali community should get out and vote and, and what were issues facing the Somali community, and that was published in English and in Somali. And we've done similar things with Spanish, Bengali, Arabic, I think. Um, and here we've got an example of this idea that it's kind of accessible journalism which draws people in rather than just writing and expecting people to read it. So this was a roundtable discussion with members coming and talking about sexual violence in the city. And this one was a roundtable discussion that was organised that was um, members of the Kurdish community in Bristol having a discussion about what was relevant to them. The idea is really to produce journalism that is effectively accessible to members of the various communities in Bristol. So it's not the case that just black and white print is uh, what we're going to sort of stand for, making it very jargony and something of interest just to people who are interested in politics and journalists, but really to expand that and to uh, bring out the, the remit of what the audience can be and really sort of try and yeah, cover issues that matter a lot to, to people in their everyday lives. And another sort of key feature of what our editorial approach uh, has been and it's been sort of described here is we try and relate uh, local issues to international and national issues. So there's stuff that will affect first of in communities very much sort of like, you know, in, in your own neighborhood. The stuff that happens on a, on a national level that has an impact directly on people who are part of our immediate uh, community surrounding us. And so the idea is really to bring those issues to light through local uh, reporting and sort of investigating in them. Okay. Um. One of the exciting things about being a new organisation is that we haven't been stuck in a rut of the old way of doing things and trying to modernise. We've been quite sort of progressive in, in, our, in our approach from the beginning and that has involved a lot of use of um, visuals, infographics, data visualisation um, and illustrations, that sort of thing which if you pick up a copy of the cable, hopefully you'll notice that it, it looks nice and it's very beautiful. Um, but it, it's also about how we sort of produce the content as well. So data journalism, for example, we recently did um, an analysis of the vote breakdown within Bristol and within the different wards of Bristol, looking at how different demo characteristics of different wards affected which way that ward voted. And there were some quite striking results that came out of that. And that was um, all produced in terms of sort of in interactive infographics, and that went down really well. Um, we are trying to expand our use of multimedia, and it's something that we've really tried to, to do a lot of. And our biggest project with that so far was about the mayoral elections in Bristol. So we had short films interviewed with every single mayoral candidate, and the idea there as with everything, was trying to get behind the spin, ask the questions that real Bristolians wanted asked to these people, and not get the, the PR line, but to get their voices coming across as much as possible. And all, all of those videos were then presented on the website, um, and yeah, it had quite a big impact, that sort of coverage. 
The characteristic here, um, it was that it was embedded through like a program called Clint, which is essentially like an interactive platform that enables people, uh, viewers, to make their own journey through the information. Where there is a mix of text and video and photos, and they can really sort of like browse the the content as as they see fit and as you know, suits their their needs. As we mentioned before, with getting people in for roundtables and stuff, this kind of two-way interactive approach of trying to source our stories and source our information. We also do it um, in terms of either crowdsourcing information by encouraging people to submit information on the website if, if a certain story has been relevant to them, for example, or um, getting feedback on things that we've covered and what more people want to see about it. Now, um, moving on this one, well, here's a couple of examples of what we've done that's a bit more investigative. Um, this story here, this in a nutshell, <laughs> which is kind of hard to do, um, Bristol Port was owned by Bristol City Council. The ex-mayor sold the freehold to the port to a private company. What was hidden was that he was aware that this private company had started exploring whether they could frack in the water off Bristol Port. And, you know, this was kind of hidden. And it took an incredibly long time to investigate this, really using freedom of information powers as much as possible, um, sustained contact with people in the council, and a, a lot of digging, basically. And it went on for many months, but eventually the story came out and we, and we published it. And it, was, it made a big impact. It was a big splash, possibly because it came out about two days before the mayoral elections and the ex-mayor George Ferguson was standing for re-election. Um, but it's an example, firstly, of the amount of time it takes to do research intensive journalism and how, as you say, local, most local newspapers these days just can't do it and what stories can be missed if, you're, if there's nobody doing that, but also about taking risks. And a lot of media organisations nowadays are so afraid of you know, legal consequences of things that you know, they're often a bit scared to put their neck on the line. And we did. And we got threatened by, with a writ, which was purely, I think, uh, George Ferguson trying to deflect because the story was true and he had no basis for it. Um, but yeah, you have to be willing to take those risks, I think, to, to be an effective um, fourth estate and to do that job that the media should be doing. Um, and then I'll pass over to you, Alec, for the Panama Papers. Yeah, the, this Bristol Post story was something that was uh, brought to us actually by a member of the public, and so is representative of the sort of increase in, in tip-off uh, that we are receiving for, for the stories that we eventually go on to pursue and, and, and investigate. Um, this wasn't a tip-off. Everyone <laughs> was obviously aware of it. The ICIJ released its incredibly gigantic database of uh, companies and people that were associated with the practice of offshore finance uh, through the medium of um, this uh, company formation, company Mossack Fonseca, uh, we decided to actually have a, a little dig at it and uh, search through the database for what the connections were uh, with Bristol uh, and who was behind these various different connections. And to cut a long story short, there was various uh, different addresses that appeared uh, in the Panama Papers that related to Bristol, we honed in on one character that was um, an international man of mystery that happened to have like a, a very acute interest in offshore finance himself. Uh, he had set up a company, uh, offshore finance <coughs> service delivery uh, company um, that is based actually in London. And the idea behind that was just to essentially offer services to, that, that could enable companies to uh, pursue offshore um, sort of deals and schemes. Uh, and, and as so happened, he was using UK-based uh, companies in order to facilitate his own uh, offshore uh, activities. Um, and he used a company formation agent that was based in one of the neighborhoods and suburbs of Bristol. So we kind of dug into that story and really tried to map out exactly what kind of scheme and what kind of offshore so practices surrounded both uh, this, this individual and this company formation agent and see whether there was any sort of direct links between them. That's actually a story that's been uh, just recently published uh, in the print and it will go up online tomorrow. So if you want to get the full story, please uh, have, have a look at that. But that is an attempt to 
really hone in on a lot of the skills that um, investigative journalists rely upon in order to sort of get their stories. We trawled through heaps and huge amounts of um, companies' house data and information or, uh, accounts. Had to read quite a lot about um, you know, the legal practices surrounding offshore finance, the kind of legality of it, and really understanding the kind of subtleties of the schemes uh, that are at play, and just understanding just also how diverse um, the, the practice of offshoring can, can be. And you know, trying to look at also the characters that were behind, uh, behind that. So that was a very interesting uh, process and you know, also a fairly long-term investigation that we uh, carried out just uh, very recently. And essentially what we found is that this individual that is, has got most of his companies registered in, uh, in Bristol actually also operates uh, companies that are based in uh, the Bahamas, Hong Kong, Cyprus, the Seychelles predominantly as well, and Latvia, and it's got connections to, to France and uh, all sorts of other BVI-based companies. Um, so that was one of the uh, an important investigations. And here I want to kind of round off the, uh, this, this session by exploring the amount of growth that uh, the cable has sort of like uh, undergone over the past year and um, just reflect on some of the challenges that have come about as a result of this um, expansion. So to carry on with um, some of the, uh, the stories that we've been uh, sort of uncovering that were of a more investigative nature, one of the, uh, the challenges that we found is that as a result of our investigations, um, a lot of people have started to take actions and make recommendations uh, towards people who held decision-making powers uh, w within Bristol. So I've got two stories in mind. One of them was uh, a story that just showed how much uh, the University of Bristol invested in fossil fuels and other unethical kind of types of investment. And as a result of that, uh, various different campaign groups across the city referenced the cables, research, the figures that came out of it in order to really make the case to the, um, the university that it should completely change its uh, investment policy. That was also reflected in some reports that um, some councillors put towards uh, Bristol's court. Um, and so the reach of the information that we have is sort of being taken on beyond um, obviously people who are interested in any in information but also people who want to see change happen and that has led to some questions uh, amongst the editorial team and for the organization as, as well as Lorna was describing as a membership organization we invite the membership to contribute ideas as to what kind of stories they'd like to see us cover um, and also the type of content I'd like to see more of and we've had, uh, for example, a recommendation lately in the midst of Brexit and so previous um, refugee crisis to really actually make a stance as a publication to come out in favour of um, you know, putting an editorial that would be essentially su supporting migrants and you know, putting the cable out there on the line. It's something that we haven't quite made a resolution on. Uh, the debate being whether our publication should take a stance considering points of views within the organization are divergent uh, or you know whether we should remain uh, just a, a reporting uh, outfit covering stories that relate to uh, migration and, and refugee um, issues but not really sort of like take a, a, a more politicized approach. Um, so one of the other um, elements that has really sort of characterized our, our growth is just the increase in journalistic output and in the quality of it, we've delved, as Lorna just demonstrated here, into much more sort of multimedia um, um, platforms and uh, ways of presenting the information that we, that we produce. We're faced with a challenge to keep that up and essentially like, make sure that we you know, bring in more contributors and that we develop the skills of the uh, various different coordinators and, and contributors in order to sustain that in the future. And it's something that's going really well and our program of workshops is designed uh, towards that. Um, we, in the past year, have actually, uh, the cable did a talk here um, last year, the same date. And at the time, we were on 400 uh, members uh, of the cooperative. We've now increased threefold a year on to 1,200. 
with that comes the challenge of making sure that we've got the infrastructure to make sure that everyone can be engaged and involved in the most kind of democratic fashion, feel like they've got an actual stake in the organization, they can make their voices heard and that the organization is providing sufficiently uh, for them in terms of the training and workshops opportunities, but also in terms of yeah, the journalism that they've got access to. So we're striving to really um, make sure you know, the members feel a reward and feel like their sense of ownership is is uh, enhanced um, and as you can yeah see here the kind of curve is really much on, on the increase um, and one of the main reasons that is actually happening and a lot of people would claim that local media because of advertising revenues going down has no future in print and the case that we want to make is actually that print is not dead and testimony to this is our kind of strategic desire and kind of uh, keenness to um, expand uh, our print run from 10,000 to 30,000 copies per edition. Um, and it's really a case that with that print, we're able to first of all reach across Bristol because we distribute in six, over 600 locations, but we also do distribution door to door in various different residential areas. And that's really a way to make sure that the information is tangibly shared with people across the city, that information is made readily available and accessible, and that people can engage with it. And people can you know, really actually have a sense that information is being produced for them, and they can you know, know who it sort of comes from. And they, that develops a bit more of a sense of trust uh, and loyalty uh, towards uh, publication, something that's been, uh, is increasingly being, uh, being lost. So this is a map of the whole of Bristol in which we uh, distribute to. Um, in order to really sustain the kind of infrastructural development uh, of the, the organization in terms of the increasing uh, workshops that we want to do and, and the training, the, the expansion of our media production and making sure that yeah, the, the logistics behind the print and the admin of the membership is being carried out, we have uh, expanded our uh, coordinators team also quite substantially. So last November we went through like a whole round of recruitment uh, from which we essentially created a team of 12 uh, people. Um, so it, it ranges for all the various different facets of the organization to cover all the grounds. So anything from the finance and accounting to organizing the events to dealing with membership engagement, membership admin. Or, uh, organizing media trainings, uh, making sure the editorial process is really sound and, and slick and you know, sort of really productive. Um, so there's, there's all these different facets that have been uh, really important for us to, to, to develop through bringing more people in. And one of the uh, key challenges in order to be able to do that is to essentially make a financially sustainable outfit in organization and that's really also the sort of key aim of this new model for local journalism that is a media cooperative is that as a membership led organization we uh, invite our members and we ask a member to become a member to pay at least like a pound a month so that essentially creates a com community of member who feel like they've got a, a stake but also uh, enables the organization to be more independent from other um, income streams. So we're sort of working to achieve both these financial uh, needs but also the social aims at, all at once. And just in terms of uh, financial sustainability, um, in case you're curious to know more about it, uh, we've got four different types of uh, income streams. The main one that we want to see really sort of take the lead is our membership income and that's uh, increasing. We're currently making £3,000 a month and with those £3,000 we're able to cover the cost of print and also uh, an increasingly um, move towards being able to pay our coordinators. And we started paying coordinators uh, as freelancers that receive a um, little bit of uh, money for the work that they, that they do and that's you know a very sort of practically sound move in order to enable to move beyond like a just volunteer outlet to something that is much more professionalized and efficient in, in the way that we work. Advertising revenue uh, through our print is also like a source of uh, um, income. We also generate uh, about £3,000 per edition and then we make money from various different external engagements delivering presentations and workshops in, uh, in partnership with other organizations. 
uh, and then funding has crucially been um, awarded to us um, actually by the uh, David and Reva uh, Logan Foundation uh, and it's been crucial in order to sustain us uh, um, to the point where uh, our membership revenue actually sort of fulfills all the, the financial needs of the uh, organization. Um, so the idea behind the cooperative is essentially to yeah, offer like a multi-leveled, uh, multi-faceted um, you know, activities and um, you know, services that just reward the, um, the, the membership. Um, so that comes through yeah, the tangible media trainings and discounts that people receive in various different businesses across the city. But the journalism as well, the information, the idea that contributing to a well-informed population is vital uh, nowadays uh, to engage in the politics uh, on a local level. Uh, and then socially, it's also very rewarding um, to, to become involved, just to create networks, to meet people, but also to eventually sort of carry out some, 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 some work in various different um, aspects. Over the next year or so, uh, what we're really planning to do is develop partnerships with different organisations in the city. Um, there's an educational programme in the pipeline, which is us sort of organising training for people who wouldn't normally have access to, to good quality journalism training, where workshops will be delivered by different visiting speakers, with us providing a lot of a kind of supportive role in the background and, and organising and implementing the, the programme. Um, as Alex said, increasing our output, increasing the payment of contributors, and growing the membership, which is really crucial. Um, one thing we get asked a lot is, do you think it's replicable? And the answer is, the experience of the cable is that there is this need for good quality, independent local media. And you know, we hear that from, from people in the industry, from our members, from people in the community. It's a really popular idea. And so far, the cooperative model for us is working. We don't know whether it will in five years, but we can just try and try and try. So the answer is yes, and, and wouldn't it be fantastic if there was a network of media cooperatives around the country doing um, independent media that's really serving the local community and enhancing local democracy? So yes, <laughs> I think it should be replicated. Um, so we'll finish on that note, and then I'm aware it's near the end of the session time, but does anyone have any questions? So sorry, what kind of an entity are you? Are you a registered charity? Are you a company? We're registered as a community benefit society. So essentially what that requires is uh, that all the profits that are to be made eventually, uh, that they stay within the organisation or are kind of reinvested in the activities uh, to carry out the kind of social aims of the, of the organisation. Um. Way to lose the grant funding. How many uh, members do you think you would need to be sustainable? Yeah, good question. Um, so we forecasted that 2,500 members would be an ideal target to generate a revenue uh, on a yearly basis that would enable us to um, remunerate con uh, coordinators and sort of pay for just the ongoing uh, operations, so the print and just like all sorts of different uh, organisational bits of maintenance. Um, so uh, at the moment, on average, uh, a member will pay two uh, point five pounds, uh, two and a half pounds a, a month. So with two thousand five hundred pounds, yeah, we could sort of make substantially, uh, you know, enough money to sort of cover that. But obviously, going beyond that would be would be ideal. But that's our target for uh, spring next year. Um, so your coordinators are they? Your writers or your editors, or, or are they kind of more responsible for overseeing the running? It's both, and it depends what role you have. Mainly the coordinators are doing organisational tasks. Um, for example, we have a web team, an events team who organise events, a finance team, and different people who do that sort of thing. So there is a, a, a distinction between contributors who might be writers, people working on one-off projects, photographers, illustrators, designers, all sorts of people who contribute regularly but don't quite take sort of organisational roles and the people who take more organisational roles as well. Yeah, so it's been quite successful for us to work in a less affluent, less left-wing city like, I don't know, Rotherham or Doncaster or something like that. Bristol isn't, isn't affluent, only some parts of it. Um, but you're right, it is a left-wing kind of city with a, a strong kind of artsy, creative culture. And that is 
something that we've benefited from for sure. I mean, our office is in an arts community space in Stokescroft or whatever, and, and we have to be quite aware of making sure that we're not ignoring the outskirts of Bristol and staying in the areas we know. It's a really conscious effort to try and get out to areas which are less easy for us to access. Um, in terms of whether it would work in, say, Rotherham, I'm not sure. Uh, what do you reckon? I mean, it's about being able to make the kind of you know, social political kind of case for why media cooperative is relevant, uh, whether it would sort of like really sort of take hold in, in other places. I think it will depend on sort of, you know, organisational capacity and kind of input and oomph and dedication of a team. Because I mean, to get to a point where we started paying um, sort of coordinators, it took at least two years of just hard graft to just make it happen on a voluntary level. I still work part time in a, in a kitchen, uh, I mean, in a restaurant, and you know, it just has to be in order to kind of you know round off the the month. So it takes a lot of commitment, but I think yeah, the case can be made, and this is really what we're trying to sort of essentially develop is a potentially a template or at least some sort of cursory guidelines as to what is the best and most efficient way to set up a media co-op, speak to people, engage with the community and really, you know, start organising. And I think, um, yeah, with, with the right mindset, with the right vision, the right pitch, that can be replicated uh, anywhere. And I, there are examples of hyper-local publications all over the place and places that aren't necessarily, you know, a particularly left-wing place or anything. So I think there are people already in pockets around the place who are trying to do similar things with a similar ethos on different scales and in different ways but there are quite a lot of projects doing that already so you know hopefully it's not just Bristol, Brighton and London hopefully it would be <laughs> possible everywhere. And precisely I mean it is the case that moving beyond the activist crowd moving beyond the kind of you know campaigny folk the people who are interested in politics just you know through and through uh, the more kind of educated uh, fringes of the population really being able to produce the kind of information and media that can attract the interest and can speak to everyone in, the, in you know, all communities is really what is essential in order to sort of create that attraction. Um, and it is something that you know, will take time, but uh, you know, through art, it can happen, no doubt. Grants and advertising from the public sector, how much of your funding in grants comes from, say, the Bristol or the public press? And how much of your advertising revenue is coming from the public purse, please? Uh, from the public purse, in terms of advertising, there's nothing that comes comes to us. It's mainly uh, private. Essentially, what we're sort of making is that there is a case to kind of revive the type of journalism that's being produced, the type of stories that have been sort of covered, and in in doing so, people reading the stories that we've sort of published have you know sort of developed a bit of a keen interest and a keen eye for stuff that isn't really spoken about. So we've now sort of created this, yeah, kind of bilateral relationship with um, the kind of readers out there, whether there are members or the kind of, you know, the wider population of in the city to come forward and, you know, pitch some ideas about issues that they deem need some, some coverage. And it'll be up to the editorial team to, to assess whether it's a story that is worth covering or not. Um, so there is, yeah, this kind of feedback loop that involves yeah, the kind of wider community in terms of um, developing some ideas yeah, for content. Exactly. Traditionally, local media have sought to engage the audience. And this model, in a way, draws the audience to the place where you are publishing mm -hmm. uh, the journalism. And it revitalizes, in a way, the engagement of, of the audience. So I just think that's very interesting how you can revitalize local journalism. Well, yeah, thanks. That's what we're aiming for, is this idea that, you know, the community and all of our members feed into what we're doing and we try and mirror and reflect what they're, you know, suggesting to us and saying this is important to us so that we can just sort of administer that and, and deliver it based on, based on all of that feed in. So, yeah, that's kind of exactly what we're trying to, to do.